Hi everybody, Dr. Mike here. In this video, we're gonna take a quick look at the neuromuscular junction. Now the neuromuscular junction is basically the point in which a neuron speaks to a muscle to tell that muscle to contract. If we wanna be specific, the neuron is gonna be a motor neuron and the muscle is going to be skeletal muscle. We know there's three different types of muscle, right? Cardiac muscle of the heart and smooth muscle that lines the hollow organs. Here, we've got skeletal muscle, which is the muscle that's attached to the bones or the skeleton, which allows for us to consciously move. Now, what we need to do is this neuron needs to send a signal to this muscle and tell that muscle to contract. Now, you can see that there is a space between the neuron and the muscle, so something needs to cross this space. We know that the signal from a neuron is an electrical signal and that the muscle won't accept an electrical signal. It needs a chemical signal, but it turns that chemical signal again into an electrical signal. So what we have is an electrical, chemical, electrical signal that's happening. So you all know, or hopefully know a little bit about action potentials, the way a neuron fires off. And you know that there's an action potential being propagated across this membrane going down this neuron. And what this action potential basically is, is a whole bunch of voltage gated sodium channels, which are opening up in response to a charge change. So as that particular channel, sodium channel opens up, Sodium, which we know is specifically or most abundantly outside, starts to diffuse in. And because it's positive, it makes the inside of this uh, membrane slightly positive, which is actually the key to open up the next channel. So what that means is a charge is responsible for opening a channel, and this is called a voltage-gated channel, and because it's for sodium, it's called a voltage-gated sodium channel. So the next voltage-gated gated sodium channel opens up, and the next sodium goes in, makes that membrane positive, opens up the next one, and so forth. And this domino effect of sodium moving in is basically the promulgation of or propagation of an action potential moving down the neuron. Now, by the time it gets to the end of this neuron, the charge change actually doesn't open a sodium channel. The next channel it opens up is a calcium channel. And calcium moves in to the neuron. Now, here's the thing. Calcium is really good at telling neurons to release their neurotransmitters. And the way it does it is because all of these neurotransmitters or neurons need to release a neurotransmitter. That's the chemical that crosses the gap. So what calcium does is calcium basically untethers these little bubbles that we call vesicles that are filled with neurotransmitters, right? There's gonna be thousands of neurotransmitters in each of these vesicles. And so what calcium does is it basically tells this vesicle to fuse with the membrane and when the, because the vesicle is basically just a little membranous body and it fuses with this membrane and releases its components. In this case, neurotransmitters. So what we've got so far is a sodium based action potential. By the time it reaches the end of the neuron, calcium comes in through a voltage gated calcium channel Calcium untethers the vesicles that are filled with the neurotransmitter, which we haven't said what it is yet. The neurotransmitter is acetylcholine, which we sometimes write as ACH like that. And this vesicle binds with the terminal, releases its contents, and now we have the diffusion of a neurotransmitter, specifically acetylcholine, across this synapse. All right, a couple of things. What happens is when this neurotransmitter crosses the synapse, it must bind to receptors specific for that neurotransmitter. So if it's acetylcholine, it must be acetylcholine specific receptors. And there are two main types of acetylcholine receptors. You have nicotinic and muscarinic. Now for skeletal muscle, these are nicotinic receptors. Now, nicotinic sounds like nicotine, one of the components in cigarettes, and this is how we determined that these are nicotinic receptors, because nicotine activates them. So this is one reason why you have muscular effects when you smoke a cigarette. So this acetylcholine will bind to acetylcholine-specific receptors when it diffuses across this membrane, and it causes this receptor to open up channels. Now, these channels... obviously open up so their gate 
isn't a voltage, their gate is a chemical and the chemical is acetylcholine. So they're called ligand or chemically gated channels. So acetylcholine binds, flips the lid, opens that channel up and what enters? Sodium. Sodium enters and we know again sodium is on the outside of the cell and moves in. So now we've got all this influx of sodium on the inner membrane of the muscle and what that means is it depolarizes which means it goes positive again just like the action potential we were talking about before. And this influx of sodium actually travels down the muscle cell. And what you'll see is because when a muscle contracts, we don't just want the membrane of a muscle to, con to contract, we want deep in the tissue of the muscle to contract because we've got all these contractile fibers, right? These myofibrils, what are called sarcomeres. They're the contractile unit of muscle. We want it to contract and they're deep inside the muscle. So we need channels that go deep inside the muscle. These are called T-tubules. And so there's gonna be all these sodium channels all the way across, right? All the way across, even down these T-tubules. And sodium is gonna enter. Again, it's gonna do that domino-like effect where sodium comes in. Now what happens is this, as it, the membrane depolarizes, you've got this little area here called the sarcoplasmic reticulum, which sounds like the endoplasmic reticulum, and it's basically the endoplasmic reticulum of skeletal muscle, sarcoplasmic reticulum. And all you really need to know is it contains calcium. Now I did calcium in red up there, I'll do calcium red here. In skeletal muscle, calcium is stored in the sarcoplasmic reticulum. All right, when the sodium comes in and depolarizes, this triggers the sarcoplasmic reticulum to release calcium. So now we've got all this calcium released. Now why do we want calcium released deep inside the muscle cell? Because calcium is the key that allows for muscle to contract. In what way? Here, we've got the two myofibrils that allow for contraction. This whole thing here is what we call a sarcomere, and we've got myosin, which is what we call the thick filament, and we've got actin here, which is the thin filament. Now, what we want are these little heads on myosin to bind to the actin, and what it does is it binds to it and pulls it in. So we get a shortening of these myofibrils. The myosin head binds to the actin and they walk their way along by pulling it in like this, like you're pulling a rope, right? And that's what it does, shorten, shorten, shorten. That's how, you, that's how muscles contract, it's shortening of these fibers. What calcium does is there's actually a chain that's on this actin, like a bike chain, which locks the actin up and doesn't make it accessible to the myosin heads. So the calcium comes in, unlocks this chain, and now the myosin heads can bind to the actin if ATP is present. So ATP is also required. So the two things you need for muscle contraction, calcium and ATP. So to, reiter to reiterate this process, what's happening is an action potential is moving down a neuron where sodium influx is occurring. The sodium comes in, when it hits the end, it opens voltage-gated calcium channels. They tell the vesicles to release acetylcholine, thousands of acetylcholine molecules. In actual fact, it's probably about 10,000 per quanta Right? And there's probably 100,000 in the reserve pools that sit behind. So there's heaps. All this acetylcholine diffuses across, binds to acetylcholine receptors, specifically nicotinic. They open up these ligand-gated sodium channels, sodium influxes, depolarize the membrane, causes the sarcoplasmic reticulum to release all of its stored calcium deep within the muscle cell. Calcium is the key that unlocks the chain that's wrapped around actin so that the myosin heads can bind. And with ATP, the myosin will bind and pull on that chain. And what we get is a shortening of the skeletal muscle cell. Now, a couple of important points here. This gap is 50 nanometers. The synapse here is only 50 nanometers. That's nothing, right? It's a very, very narrow gap. But in saying that, when acetylcholine's released, how long do you think it has in order to bind to its receptor to initiate sodium influx? It has one millisecond to do that. One millisecond. Your question may be, what happens after one millisecond? There is a molecule which eats up acetylcholine in this synapse, and this molecule is called acetylcholine 
esterase. And acetylcholine esterase eats up acetylcholine molecules and forces them to be recycled back into the presynaptic terminal of that neuron so it could be released again. It has one millisecond to do its function before it's gobbled up and thrown back in. So, a couple of things. There are things called muscle relaxants, right? These muscle relaxants, they tell the muscles just to relax. And there's two major types, right? There's a muscle relactant, which comes in and pretends to be acetylcholine. Comes in, pretends to be acetylcholine, binds to the receptor, sodium comes in, depolarizes the membrane, calcium is released, and the muscle contracts. But, usually after one millisecond, that acetylcholine is degraded. But this drug, right, called succinylcholine, right, this drug lasts longer than acetylcholine, so isn't degraded. So that means this membrane remains depolarized, sodium stays in. Now the calcium has done its job, right, because it's already depolarized, calcium's come in, muscles contracted, but this remains depolarized and doesn't reset like it normally would. When acetylcholine jumps off, sodium will be thrown back out and you reset the membrane. You can't tell that muscle to contract without that depolarization. But if that remains on, sodium remains in and it doesn't reset. But the calcium gets thrown back in independent of that depolarization and the calcium jumps back in here so the muscle relaxes but can't be triggered again to contract because it's remained depolarized. So that muscle becomes flaccid. So with succinylcholine, what you first get is muscle contractions called fasciculations, immediately followed by paralysis. And that's how these succinylcholine, uh, succinylcholine I should say, works, often used as in anesthetics or operations. Now, you've also got a type, so that's what, what we call a depolarizing muscle re relaxant, but there's non-depolarizing muscle relactants, non-depolarizing muscle relactants that work as well, which means they don't bind and cause this depolarization effect. What they do is they will bind to these acetylcholine receptors and inhibit acetylcholine from binding, which just means that no depolarization occurs, no calcium release occurs, no contraction occurs. All right? So you've got, you've got non-depolarizing muscle relaxants. Now, in order to reverse these, there is a particular drug that can be given. And what this drug does is it gets rid of the acetylcholine esterases. And that means the acetylcholine can now competitively bind against these non-depolarizing muscle relaxants and pop it off. And then the acetylcholine can bind and the muscle can contract, okay? So what we've gone through is a very quick run through, a relatively quick run through of the neuromuscular junction.